I'm going to talk about today is um, using leukemia as, as sort of a model of, of using molecular biology um, in both looking at diagnostics that have uh, implications to clinical research and also as, as potential targets. And I'm going to use uh, AML, acute myeloid leukemia, and CML as a sort of models of where I think that not only all the leukemias but really all of solid tumors will eventually uh, go. So here's, um, just to start off, this is both a slide that you can uh, take in an optimistic bend or you can completely be bummed out and you know, leave in about two minutes when I explain it to you. Um, on the left here is, these are SEER data, and if I can show it on this side, this is basically uh, population incidence rates of these diseases. So, so none of these diseases are public health menaces. They're relatively rare. And you can see that they bounce around a little bit. One of the ones I'm going to be talking about today is CML, which is uh, this one here in, in uh, red. So that's only about two per 100,000. AML is up here in green. So they're relatively low incidence. The, the, the curve on the right is the one that's actually the, the one that's a little bit disconcerting. This is age-adjusted mortality rates of these diseases over time in the country. And so you can see that some of these diseases, like let's take acute myeloid leukemia here, you can say that since 1975 until 2005, we obviously have not made any inroads in curing these patients. Wouldn't that, same is true with the other diseases, except CML. This is CML here. You can see it's been pretty steady over time. And here it drops down dramatically. And as we'll show, we'll talk about later, this is from the introduction of the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, imatinib. So in one of these diseases, we made an impact. The rest of these diseases, we made no impact. And this is sort of disconcerting, because if you imagine, there's a lot of smart people who have worked in AML since 1975. It's each of those persons in their whole lifetime of work contributed an independent 1% to survival. These diseases would be eradicated. So all you have to do in your whole lifetime of work is an independent 1%. That's all you're shooting for, and these diseases would be gone. So that must be a pretty tough nut to crack. And we'll go and talk about a little bit about why. So let's kind of talk about AML first. In AML, there's some, some usual uh, prognostic factors. Age and size genetics are the, are the most uh, important prognostic factor. I used to be kind of amused when I started out doing this stuff decades ago that um, we used to use 55 as the cutoff for defining something called elderly AML. Now I find this mostly insulting. <laughs> And we kind of moved the age out as the investigators have all aged. But, but clearly, age is, is probably the single most important prognostic factor in AML. And I'm not going to talk about elderly AML today because that's a little bit different kettle of fish. But cytogenetics is the, the second most important thing. And if you looked at, at patients who are 16 to 55 who are treated with newly diagnosed AML, you can really break people into three groups just simply based on their cytogenetic evaluation. So the top was quote unquote favorable with overall survival is around 60% are those that have the 15-17 uh, translocation, APL, acute promyelocytic leukemia, and those that have the core binding factor translocations, that would be um, the uh, um, um, inversion 16 and the A21s. In the middle are those that have uh, normal risk, and so that gives you a survival of somewhere between 25 to 40 percent. Those, the predominantly, those are people with normal uh, karyotypes, so normal cytogenetics. And down below, you have the complex cytogenetics and minus fives and minus sevens. So simply as you walk in the room and you get cytogenetics on people, you can get a pretty good idea of what their prognostic uh, is, is going to be just based on, complete, on cytogenetics. Now you can construct these roadmaps of how to take uh, care of patients based first on their cytogenetics. And we'll march through this quickly, but just to get an idea of where you can actually add modern molecular biology to the conventional cytogenetics and try to make these, these um, categories a little bit more fine cut. So first we'll go over here and, and base the cytogenetics on good risk groups. So again, the A21s, the inversion 16s, and look at a few mutations that have been of note. The first one we'll talk about are C-kits. C-kits a, a, a receptor tyrosine kinase. Um, it only occurs in about 5 to 10% of, of AMLs overall. But if you look at people with um, 821s and inversion 16s, it's much more predominant in that group, somewhere between 20 and 50%, depending on, on where you go. Like many of the tyrosine kinase mutations, like FEMS, like FLT3, uh, and like RAS, which is downstream in the pathway from tyrosine kinases, the presence of these mutations are associated with, with um, higher white counts at, at diagnosis. And it confers a relatively risk, higher risk of relapse. So if you look at patients who have favorable risk disease, so 821s or inversion 16s, if you have a kit wild type, 
your survival goes from 60% up to 80%, whereas if you have the mutation, it drops down to 40% or below. Here's another study showing relatively the same thing with the 821s. These are Kaplan-Meier curves, so you can kind of disregard this last falling off as the last patient with the farthest fall-up dies. But if you just look at the overall survival here, again, favorable risk disease. This is the groups of the wild type. You have a KIT3 mutation, or a KIT mutation. You basically succumb to gravity here on the uh, survival curves. So you've taken someone who's a, who's a high risk group, a, a good risk group patient, and pushed them down to an intermediate risk or below simply by assaying for the KIT mutation. So that's one. But you can go, most of the work that's been done is in the intermediate group. Again, these are people who probably have a survival of about 25 to, to 40 percent. And there's a number of mutations that have been des described in normal karyotype AML. The most prominent is the NPM mutation. You'll find that in about 50% of patients with normal karyotype. ITD mutations of the FOOT3 gene, which we'll talk about in a minute, about 30%. Less in younger kids, so like pediatric cases, about 10%. As you get to elderly AML in the 60s or so, it goes up to about 50%. Tyrosine point mutations in the tyrosine kinase domain of FOOT3, about 11%. And then these other mutations, more rarely. Now, first, let's talk about the, the major one that was first described, the FOOT3 ITD mutation. This is, FOOT3 is, in, again, a receptor tyrosine kinase. And how it operates, um, it usually sits out in the membrane sort of by itself. And when ligand binds, if it gets a ligand, it then dimerizes and then causes proliferation to the MAP kinase pathway. So it actuates through RAS, then downstream through ERK. Um, what happens with these mutations is a mutation in the so-called internal tandem, uh, in the, in the so-called juxtamembrane uh, area, which is right, if I can get this to work, here, causes the, the usual pressure of these, uh, mem of these receptors to be apart, the, re the repelling properties, to actually come together. And you actually get ligand-free dimerization and activation. And how this happens is by two mechanisms of activation. One is by an internal tandem duplication which is a head-to-tail duplication of anywhere between 30 to 200 base pairs. I'll show you that in a second. Or you can get activation of this, uh, of this molecule by single base pair mutations, activating mutations, which functionally have the same effect of increasing proliferation. So you can look for these mutations in a variety of ways. This is a, the juxtamembrane uh, domain. And what I've done here in, car in a cartoon is this section here has been duplicated and put in a head-to-tail orientation causing a longer uh, area here, which you can see by PCR. These are the wild types here. This is the wild type, and this is the allele that has a ITD mutation. This has a bigger one. This one, again, is a wild type, different size entirely here. Again, and one interesting thing about this is when you put them in head to tail, if it's out of frame, you'll actually insert nucleotides randomly to put the whole protein in frame again. So it's almost like VDJ rearrangements in ALL. The mechanisms of that is unclear. And here's the point mutations. In the, usually in the tyrosine kinase 2 region. And this is just an assay where when you get this specific mutation, you can digest it with an echo R1 virus and get smaller bands. So this is a patient with a mutation here. Now, do these things make a difference? Uh, indeed, they do. First discovered in, in pediatric AML by uh, Michelle, uh, Sohail Mashinsi when he is in our lab. And you can divide up patients on whether they have the FOOT3 positive or negative. And you can see on this curve here, these are the patients who are wild type. These are the patients who are positive. Reproduce later in adults. Again, positive uh, disease here. These are the wild types here. In larger studies by uh, the uh, Germans and, uh, and English, you can again show that patients with the mutation have a much higher rate of, of relapse risk, 70% for AMLs versus 50%, and an and a, and a, uh, inferior survival. Now, it turns out that, that mutation alone doesn't convey the, the whole uh, risk. In fact, there's a, a property called allelic ratio. So if you look at, at patients in, with FOOT3 mutations, you can find that some people are in a heterozygous state, so they have an ITD as well as a wild-type allele. Some of them will be homozygous with either wild-type or homozygous with all ITD. And some populations will be heterozygous with various ratios, so more uh, population of the ITD or less. And this, you can see this uh, using an ABI uh, machine that will d discriminate by size. This is a wild type here. That's the wild type band. Here is a uh, patient who has an allelic ratio of the wild type and a fairly high mutant band. This patient here is virtually all mutant band. And this one is intermediate here. 
And as it turns out, if you have um, mutated ITD that isn't compensated by the wild type, the more mutated allele you get, the worse it is. And you can see this in, in various ways. You can basically divide up the amount of ratio, which is basically just the ratio of these peaks, and say, well, if people have less allelic ratio, so the more, more wild type component, they do well. And as you get more and more ITD and less and less normal allele, your survival declines. You can also actually make the cutoff also by just the, the actual numerical ratio. And this is uh, taken from the German groups. These are patients who have a low allelic ratio, meaning they have relatively more wild type in the sample. Intermediate, and as you can see, the high risk patients do, if we get this to work, much worse. So not just having the ITD makes a difference, but the allelic ratio makes a difference. And in the current COG trials, children's trials, they'll go on to get FLT3 inhibitor based not just by the presence or absence of the FLT3 mutation, but actually by the allelic ratio. So people with high allelic ratio <coughs> will automatically get FLT3 inhibitor. Uh, those people who have these low allelic ratio will actually get standard therapy. The, now the most common mutation found has been, uh, FLT3 has been supplanted, and now it's found to be this NPM mutation, which is another insertion mutation. Usually you have about eight to, four to eight base pairs. The function of NPM isn't, isn't known, but it's usually a nuclear protein. And when you get this, this uh, insertion, you actually localize to the cytoplasm. And even though the real function isn't known, we know a fair amount about the prognosis now in AML. You can combine NPM and FLT3 to basically make a grid of, uh, of patients. So if you look at overall survival here, if you're a FLT3 wild type and you have the NPM1 mutation, that's actually a relatively good prognosis. So you move survival rates from 40% to 60% or greater if you have the NPN uh, mutation in the context of having a normal wild type FLT3. All of the combinations drop off. So this is the NPM mutant positive FLT3 wild type, NPM uh, wild type, FLT3 wild type, and the worst is the NPM wild type FLT3 positive. So now in, in most uh, uh, studies, or in, in many uh, cooperative group studies, the two mutations that people will get right off the bat in people who have normal karyotype are NPM1 and FLT3. And in the clinical decision making we do, you'll often see people who are moved to transplant uh, who have intermediate risk disease if they have the FLT3 mutation in the context of wild type uh, NPM. On the, on the contrary, you would never transplant someone in first remission if they had an NPM positive with a wild type FLT3 because that's elevated people into a better risk group. Lastly, you can combine with uh, one more mutation, the CEBP alpha uh, mutation. And uh, CEBP alpha is a transcription factor. And again, for reasons we're not quite sure, actual mutations in this gene actually push you into a better risk group. And there are the curves here. These are patients, and let's look at the overall survival. These are patients who have MPM positive, FLT3 negative. So their survival is about 60%. Those who have CEBP alpha patients. And here are all the others. So you've, break it up, you've broken up an intermediate risk group where their survival plateaus around 40%, and you push them into a group here that's above the curve at about 60%. And if you take that curve and bring out, take out the, the good risk groups, you really push this intermediate group down to about 20%. So the ones that don't have these uh, mutations that confer good prognosis, their survival really has now dropped down into a bad risk AML. And this is a nice curve that basically shows the relative frequency of these mutations and how they overlap. Uh, this is uh, done by Schleck, looking at about 800 patients. If you look at the FLT3 IT positive patients, about 30% of the normal carrier types have it. Wild type uh, MPM, FLT3 negative, about 30%. And here's the MPM positive, FLT3 IT negative, 30%. And you can see how they overlap. There's a fair amount of overlap between patients who have FLT3 mutation and MPM1. A fair amount of NRAS and MPM1. Not much overlap between NRAS and FLT3 ITD because I had mentioned earlier they're in the same signaling pathway. So if you have one mutation, another mutation doesn't confer any selective advantage. So it'd be relatively rare to have those types of mutations. So if you look at what we can do now, just looking at a scattering of molecular tests and how they, many of them will actually help define what therapy you should get. So in cytogenetics, or by PCR, the PMLRR mutation, these, these is APL, and they are specifically, exquisitely sensitive to either ATRA or arsenic differentiation therapy. So a patient comes in with this <laughs> mutation, it puts them on a completely different protocol path. Those patients with inversion 16, the MAH1 uh, CBPF, or AML-EDO, 
again, only about 10% of cases in each of these, but they're very sensitive to high-dose ARC, so they usually get a regimen that, that has that in it. FLT3 mutations, we'll talk about uh, the role that tyrosine kinase inhibitors might play in that. And for the point mutations, uh, RAS mutations, theoretically you could use pharnacyl transferase inhibitors, um, because, but although that hasn't proved very beneficial in the clinic. For the FLT3 point mutations or KIT, uh, receptotyrosine kinase inhibitors, again, at least theoretically, might be, be models. So there's been a lot of interest now, since we can identify FLT3 uh, mutations, to bringing drugs that target that kinase. And you would think that, and, and part of this work is, we'll, we'll talk, I'm kind of putting them out of order, um, but the CML work, where b able is a tyrosine kinase, imatinib has been so spectacularly successful that when FLT3 was identified as a prominent mutation in AML, people were quite excited because they thought, oh, this is going to be like imatinib. We're going to give these guys a single drug, and it's going to cure their disease. Well, in AML, the, the problem with that model is that in CML, imatinib works in chronic phase, but when you transfer into a more aggressive disease that resembles acute myeloid leukemia, like blast crisis, imatinib doesn't work there at all. It's genetically too heterogeneous and complex a disease. So I think people were sort of wishing beyond hope that a tyrosine kinase inhibitor would work as a single agent in AML. Um, and in fact, it, it hasn't worked uh, as single agents uh, basically at all. And there's been a number of uh, phase uh, one and two trials. And you can you maybe see complete remissions in two to five percent of cases at most uh, by, with single agent drugs uh, alone. And it, they generally don't work very long at all. But there's been a number of studies of now where tyrosine kinase are being added to conventional 7 and 3 therapy, anthracycline based therapy. And there it looks like it may have, may have a place. So this is a study where you've looked at patients who have the wild type mutation and those that are FLT3, small study, only about uh, 40 patients. And just, there's not a lot of follow up on these patients yet, but just looked at complete response data. So this is just adding one of the tyrosine kinases, mitosaurin, to, to the induction regimen. Without the drug, or, or, or with the FLT3 negative patients, the drug doesn't work much, 77%. But if in the patients who have activated for 3 you can get complete remission rates up to 92%. The same is true of a drug called serafinib, which is a, a drug that inhibits tyrosine kinases and a bunch of other kinases. And here, again, we're going to just concentrate on complete remissions. In patients who have wild-type for 3 their complete remission rate is uh, 56%. And then the authors in this study basically divided people into whether their FLT3 ITD had a higher or low allele ratio. You can see for both of these, the response rate is pretty good. So you had about a 92% versus a 56% complete response rate. So that's at least leaning, going in the right direction. That being said, if you look at these patients now, they're up to about a one to two year follow up. Um, survival doesn't look like it's going to be much different. So like many agents, it looks like it's going to get them into complete remission more often, but they relapse fairly quickly. That may be circumvented by changing the trial structure. So all of these trials have basically added these drugs with induction therapy, but not into the consolidation and maintenance phase. And so it may well be that to really get these drugs to work, you're not only going to have to give them an induction to get complete remissions, but then to put these people on drugs for a long period of time. So I haven't given up hope. But now, from these types of mutation stuff, you can get these completely, this is the uh, National Cancer Care Network guidelines. You can get these elaborate tree structures, which you need like a GPS system to navigate through if you're, if you're a clinician. And this reminds me of a sign that I encountered once. Um, this basically that not all signs are helpful. There's a sign in, in China that has like, you know, five different languages. Says, this sign is to prevent forward tours from getting lost. So it's, Often these, these, these roadmaps of therapy are, are, are really not very useful, like this sign. But this is the way you can kind of reconstruct in AML the cytogenetic package. So here's our favorable risk cytogenetics, our intermediate risk, and our complex. And then we move in molecular markers to, to kind of influence risk. So favorable risk are these translocations or an NPM mutation and a wild type flit in a, a person with normal karyotypes, that moves those people to here, right? If you have patients with um, um, a KIT mutation, they can move from here down to here. So good risk that has a KIT mutation drops down. And uh, here the wild type NPM and foot 3 ITD with a high allelic ratio moves from intermediate to down. So you can start combining conventional cytogenetics and these molecular markers to sort of restructure what risk groups really are. 
This is another way of doing it uh, that we propose for SWOG. Again, 1517 are the great risk. 821s with kit mutations, wild type, normal mutation go down there. And we talked about the NPM uh, going from either intermediate risk or pushing them down to poor risk. Now, this is all fine, fine and good, but at, at SWOG, at Southwest Oncology Group, there's currently no money from the NCI to do this kind of testing. So they asked me to come up with something uh, faster and cheaper that we could actually do in a large trial. And so this is a modification of um, the Monty Python method, where you actually, you, you, you drown someone, you know, and she turned me into a newt. <laughs> and if you sink, you're at a good risk. Um, and if you float, you then move to tarot cards. And if you get un angel, sun, wheel of fortune, it moves you into a good risk. Uh, devil, death, or hangman, poor risk. And others is the intermediate risk. And I think this is, um, this is a, you know, we can do this pretty quickly. It takes only a small tub, and it's uh, relatively cheap. So I think that, uh, you know, surprisingly enough, I think that the, the SWOG might be interested in this. So, so let's really get to turn now to um, CML. Now, CML is, you know, like I said, it's, it's really not a public health menace. It's two per 100,000. But in, in grants and the like, we always talk about this, this proverbial going from bench to bedside. You know, and a lot of that is grantsmanship, frankly. Um, but, but in CML, it, it, it's really probably true. I mean, CML was the first disease where a unique chromosomal abnormality associated with disease was found, the Philadelphia chromosome. Um, this is a reciprocal translocation between chromosome 9 and 22, so-called, because Peter Knoll discovered it at the Winstar Institute. Um, otherwise, it might be the buffalo chromosome or something. Um, it, was a, it was the first uh, disease where specific gene uh, responsible associated with that chromosome was detected. So in the Philadelphia chromosome, they found that it's the juxtaposition of, chromosome, of the BCR gene from chromosome 22 with the downstream tyrosine kinase domain of ABL. And so that was the first time, the first disease where that type of unique gene fusion was found to be uh, 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 pathogenic in the disease. It was the first disease where you could actually utilize uh, molecular detection like B PCR to monitor patients based on this fusion uh, micro uh, mRNA. And, and now it's the first disease where a real uh, so-called targeted therapy, tyrosine kinases, have been used to actually attack this ABLE. So it's really an amazingly model of a disease. Now this is the days before imatinib, um, just to show that, that even though it's chronic myeloid leukemia, uh, when you progress to accelerated phase and blast crisis, uh, sort of all hell breaks loose. Um, so this is, even though it's chronic, it's really not that chronic. This is the days when you couldn't really cure people. So the median survival, once you were diagnosed in chronic phase, was, was only 71 months. In accelerated phase, 28 months. And in blast crisis, people die routinely of bleeding complications and infections because their normal hematopoiesis is gone. This is what, this is a really dramatic slide from the MD Anderson. It shows different eras of CML chronic phase patients and how they've been changed with therapy. So the, the white curve here, yeah, my mouse will work, there we go, is really before you had any therapy at all. Okay, uh, then this may be busulfan. The, this curve here is uh, hydroxyurea, interferon era, interferon era C era, and this is the imatinib era. So this is an, an unbelievable change in the natural history of the disease by targeted therapy. So how we got into this is, uh, you know, we, we, we were doing uh, PCR in the days when there was um, water baths, you know, and you had to like, you know, move things from one water bath to the next every, every one, two minutes. Uh, so, you, so you set up with, you know, the New York Times, you know, and, and a glass of water, and there you were for the next four hours basically doing that. Um, so we got involved in, in, in developing tests that would, would monitor the mRNA level of BCR ABL. And what we found in the transplant setting, this is before imatinib, when transplantation was really the only cure for, for, for CML, is that simply by looking at patients after transplant, you could predict in people who looked like they were cured by all the ways, who was going to relapse and who wasn't. So this is a, a curve here is patients in the 6 to 12 month following transplant and taking patients who look like they're cured and saying, well, if you quantitate their PCR, what happens? So if you're negative, your risk of relapsing in the next year is only about 4%. But if you were quantitatively positive, even a single copy of BCRable, your risk was about 20%. At 100 copies, your risk was 40%. So then you could start really looking at patients and saying, yeah, you look like you're cured, but we know, in fact, that you're going to you have a high chance of relapse, we need to do something else, interfere on second transplant, something, right? So with that technology, when the imatinib trials came in, uh, we and two other labs started to, to follow patients. 
So this is the, uh, the IRIS trial. And this is where we got most of the data for, for CML out of. Um, you know, I often worry in, in cancer, we, we often, the, the trial design is based on the acronym. We kind of develop the acronym and go backwards, right? And, and this, well, lymphoma guys have the best ones. They've got COP and BLAM and Cytobom and all these things. Um, the IRIS was actually uh, named after the head administrator of Novartis in Basel. Who, whose name was Iris, and so they've kind of back, you know, engineered it to be the International Randomized Trial of Interferon versus STI, which is what, what Nematida was called then. This was the single fastest accruing randomized trial in leukemia history. They accrued 1,000 patients in a year, a little bit less than a year, and the trial design was basically that you had newly diagnosed CML, you got a matidib versus the standard, which is Aeroferon and an Aero-C. And you could cross over because if you didn't have enough um, response, or if you had uh, problems with tolerance. Now the tolerance was very hard to to cross over because the word on the street was that imatinib was so good when you talk to patients they'd, they would tell you if I get randomized to interferon I'm getting sick and I'm switching over. So if you were complaining of toxicity you had to go in front of a board to, to cross over. So that was uh, controlled pretty well. Um, this trial was was stopped early because of both efficacy and um, and uh, rate of crossover. So as you can see here, 39% of the interferon ERA-C arm crossed over to imatinib because of efficacy, basically. Only 1% crossed over in the imatinib arm to interferon. So a remarkable difference. This is what the responses looked like. So uh, this is uh, one of the most common shown slides from this data set. It's actually one of the most commonly misinterpreted data, so I'll walk you through that. These are cumulative incidence plots. Uh, and so what it shows in red is the time it takes to get complete hematological remission. That just means normalization of your blood counts. So most CML patients come in with a Y count of about 100,000. So this is the time it takes to be, become normalized. And most patients will normalize their counts by about three months, which is pretty remarkably fast. And then you can look at, these are measures of cytogenetic response, major cytogenetic response, which means two-thirds of your chromosome metaphases are free of uh, Philadelphia chromosome and normal. And complete cytogenetic response is what you expect. You know, all your metaphases are normal. And so by 12 months, when the study was closed, 69% um, or 68% of pa patients achieved a complete cytogenetic response, as opposed to only 7% on the interferon and ARC arm. Um, the p study was actually powered for that arm to be, have a rate of 25%. It, it greatly underperformed. That's probably because another way you could cross over is if you didn't take your medicine. So a lot of people, we, we think, didn't, didn't take their interferon so they could cross over to the imatinib arm, which was, turned out to be the smart thing to do. Um, now, how this is misinterpreted is that, is that when well, many people see this, they say, well, gee, this is great. At five years out, 80, almost 90% of my patients will be in complete cytogenetic response. That's not true because this is a cumulative incidence plot. So once you've achieved a complete cytogenetic response, even if you achieve it only for a nanosecond, you count on the curve. So in fact, if you look at that five years out, only about 50% of patients are still on drug uh, in complete cytogenetic remission. They've dropped out because of either intolerance issues or because of efficacy issues. But nonetheless, it's you know, absolutely a, a tremendous drug. And this is a survival, event-free survival and progression-free survival, and you're talking 80 to 90%. So that's really revolutionary good drug. So based on this, you can get response criteria um, and use that to decide how patients are doing. Now there's two major groups that do response criteria that you'll see. One is the NCNN that I talked about before. Uh, and one is the, the ELN, the uh, European Leukemia Net. I'm uh, an honorary European. I'm on this commission and also the NCNN. Um, and, and they're very similar except for two things. The NCNN concentrates on people who are doing well and those who are failing. So our, our main role there is we want to kind of let people know when they should be switching drugs. Um, the ELN divides it up into optimal uh, and then failure, which is the same as NCN. But then they have all these other things like suboptimal and warning. And you know, I, I think most of us worry enough. And you know, and then these <laughs> the, uh, these are basically categories where you don't do anything differently. You just kind of like brood about it, you know, and stuff. So, so we we really concentrate on the failure rate, and so it's pretty actually easy to, to decide winners and losers with this drug on therapy. You basically say at three months, if you don't have a complete hematologic response, you fail imatinib. Um, 
if by six months you haven't had some cytogenetic response, and that's minimal, you just have to like budge, right? You have to start off 20 out of 20 metaphases positive. If you're at 18, that counts as a response. A partial cytogenetic response at 12 months, which means you want at least two thirds of your chromosomes free of, of, the, of the filler of your chromosome. By 18 months, you need to have a complete cytogenetic response. And at any time, if you lose your response or develop new clonal abnormalities, that's considered a failure. So does that work? Uh, it's really surprisingly good. So this is a, a busy plot, and I won't torture you and plow all the way through it. But this looks at patients um, study uh, at the Hammersmith in England, and just uh, applied those criteria below to see how people do. And so you can divide patients, in, um, and we'll concentrate on this one, the six-month one. So let's just divide people into two groups, those who have failed therapy or people who have done anything better than failure. So just fail, not fail. So in the blue curves are those that have failed. So if you look here, this is the proportion of patients um, who will ever get a complete cytogenetic response based on their six-month value. So if you failed at six months, your chance of ever going on to get a complete cytogenetic response is only 20%. As opposed to if you've done anything better than failure, your risk, your chance is 90%. So that's a pretty good cutoff. You can also, the top two plots look at progression-free survival. If you are a failure, you're down to 70%. And if you have done anything better than failure, you're at 90%. And those type of, of things hold through all of these. They're really very, very good criteria for telling patients and predicting who's going to do well and who's not, just by basis of their cytogenetic categories at, at those time points. But you can actually do even better. And that is by adding molecular diagnostics. This curve looks at the 12-month landmark data and divides people into three groups and looks at their progression-free survival. So the first group is those who have not had a complete cytogenetic response. Their progression-free survival is about 75%. This, these two up here are patients who have gotten a complete cytogenetic response, but then you do PCR on their blood. And we invented something called major molecular response, which is basically a three-log reduction or more. So you say you're in complete cytogenetic response, and you have a greater than three log reduction in your disease level, you're golden. Your progression-free survival is 97%. Versus in between, a good cytogenetic response, but not quite a major molecular response, you're at about 90%. So that's pretty good. You can then use this to determine uh, other landmarks, use the PCR test. We have a concept now uh, called complete molecular response, which really means just undetectable B able. Now, it's a little bit tricky phrase because you can get undetectable complete molecular response two ways. One's if a patient who has a great response to the drug, and the second thing is send the result to a crummy lab, which will almost always come back negative. It's probably not the same clinically. Um, but it appears that, that getting into a complete molecular response is an important thing. Um, and, the, and the reason being that you know, when we first started this, we, th we thought that people would have to be on imatinib forever. Because you can actually take CML stem cells, or at least things you think are stem cells, Im immature cells, and put them in uh, petri dishes with tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and they don't kill the cells. They kind of just sit around in a dormant. So we figured, well, if you can't kill the, the stem cells, then there's no way that people will ever get off drug. They'll have to be on drug forever, right? There's now three trials. Uh, the first one that's now been published um, in Lancet Oncology a couple months ago uh, by the French have looked at patients who become completely molecular negative. That happens in about 10% of patients on long-term therapy. They'll, their PCR will be negative persistently. Surprisingly enough, if you take people who are two years completely molecular negative off drug, about half of them relapse pretty quickly. Disease comes back. The other halves have been stayed negative for a couple of years. So there may be a subset of patients who can actually get off these drugs, which is really quite surprising to us. So that's made people interested in using complete molecular response as a possible endpoint. So this study looks at if you have an MMR or not at 12 months, what's your chance of, of ever becoming undetectable? And it's sort of what you expect. If by 12 months you've had a three log reduction, right? your chance of becoming completely molecular negative is about 
Whereas if you haven't gotten that far that fast by 12 months, your chance of ever becoming completely negative, just one drug alone, is pretty low. So there are trials now where we're trying to actually give this group of patients who aren't major market response at 12 months either a stronger tyrosine kinase or adding another type of inhibitor, like a hedgehog inhibitor or a SMO inhibitor, um, to basically drive those stem cells down to extinction. This just looks at backing up even further. Let's look at three months. Can you get information from the peripheral blood at three months that makes a difference? And this just looks at the probability of MMR, so the chance that you're ever going to get a major molecular response based on just your three-month level. And it's sort of as you expect. If you have a no log or a one log reduction, your chance of ever getting a major molecular response is pretty darn low. And if you go on the other extreme, if your disease has already gone down two logs in, th in three months, the chance that it's going to go down further another log is virtually guaranteed. This just shows that this is the flip side of this. This is a resistance and shows exactly what you expect. If you've had a crummy response at three months by major molecular response or by uh, log reduction, your chance of, ever, of getting resistance is, in fact, quite high. And this is the, the last uh, study that look, uh, looked at this. This is, again, looking at just time to response, again, on a peripheral blood assay, and saying, here's your time to major molecular response, and here's the events in forward time, meaning loss of response, resistance, getting accelerated phase of blast crisis. If your disease responds fast and you get into a major molecular response by six months, the chance of anything bad happening to you is 0 out of 41, and the chance that you're getting a complete molecular response is 90%. Completely logically, if you are one that has kind of poopy disease, slow to, to, to go away, your chance of having something happen is 15%, infinitely higher. Your chance of ever getting to a complete molecular response is only 40%. So the, the peripheral blood PCR testing is, is extremely valuable prognostic uh, indicator. And it's great because you don't have to do bone marrows. You just do it on peripheral blood every three months, and you get a very amount of detail about how people are doing. So what happens if you're following someone and their disease molecular load goes in the opposite direction? Is that bad? You assume so, and the answer is pretty much yes. Now, the first thing you have to do when this happens is ask people if they're taking their drug. You would think that, that imatinib would be a really easy drug to take, right? It's a once-a-day drug, not a lot of toxicity, very efficacious. You would think that compliance would be really quite good. So there's been a number of studies now where they've done pill counts, or in, in England, they've actually put radio frequency sensitizers in the caps of pills so they can actually tell how many times you take them off, and then they can figure out how, how many pills you take. So if you do self-reporting and you say to people, how often, how religiously do you take your drug, right? So what would you guess that people say, I'm perfectly adherent? Like 70% of people say, I'm perfectly adherent. When you do the pill count, the count is actually about 30%. Um, and and the, by far the most <coughs> important thing in keeping people in major molecular response and getting there is taking the medicine. Not surprising, right? So a lot of times when you see people whose PCR goes up, especially if they've been low a long time, you have to ask them, are you taking your meds? Because people sometimes who are getting a great response will, and especially if they're paying for this thing out of pocket, this is a $25,000 to $50,000 drug a year. If you had a great molecular response and you're paying for out of pocket, people will hoard and take off and give themselves a drug holiday for a while, which is, you know, understandable. So the first thing when, when the, the tests bump up is make sure they're actually taking their drug. But nonetheless, sometimes it means that their disease is coming back. So here's, here's two curves showing um, relapse-free survival. Uh, and, uh, and this one here basically shows what happens if your disease goes up a half a log two subsequent times. And if you have a rise of half a log, your chance, your relapse-free survival drops from about 85% down to about 25%. So clearly showing that things are going in the wrong direction. This looks at if you're in a major molecular response, what happens if you come out of major molecular response? And that basically shows if you have no loss of major molecular response, you're golden. Again, if you lose major molecular response, the chance of your really up street survival drops fairly dramatically. So it's a pretty good predictive test on how people are doing. Why people usually become resistant is actual single point mutations in the ABLE tyrosine kinase. And so what you can imagine is if, if ABLE tyrosine kinase kind of flips from an off conformation to an on conformation, these mutations basically change the structure of the molecule so the imatinib can't bind. 
And various mutations do that with various, with better or less efficiency. But really, a single mutation, you can find in about 50% of patients with resistance. And you can construct now tables um, based on so-called IC50s of these various mutations. So you take a cell line that has, doesn't have BCR able, you put that, you put a the BCR able construct in it and basically give all of these different clones different mutations. Then you grow them in, in wells and see what concentrations of these drugs will inhibit about 50% of the colonies. And various ways of doing this give slightly different results. But what it allows you to do is when you give a patient with a mutation is to look and see what kind of mutation they have and get a rough idea of what drug, what are the new types and kinases might work better than other ones. So it's very similar to what you do, we do in infectious disease. Now, it doesn't always work. Sometimes you have patients who have a sensitive mutation on paper and do, they don't respond to drug and vice versa. But as a rough guideline, if you have someone who becomes resistant to imatinib, you can start to get some idea of what drug you might want to take them from the two, from, from the two other drugs that are available, nilotinib and, and disatinib. The one that doesn't work is a so-called 359 mutation, which all the drugs right now out there available, none of them work on. So there are two new drugs out there now, the satinib and nilotinib that have been okayed, and those were first tested in the salvage setting. So the question is then, if you have someone with imatinib, they become resistant, can you salvage by putting on a second generation drug? These drugs in general are about 30 fold more uh, uh, potent than imatinib. Nilotinib was designed after imatinib with some structural differences, so it's really a pretty pure BCR able, uh, able inhibitor. Uh, Desatinib was a drug that was on the shelf. It was actually originally a SARC inhibitor, but it has very potent BCR able activity, so it inhibits a, a bunch of kinases. So this curve shows basically the desatinib results, very similar trials, people failing uh, imatinib because of either intolerance or because of resistance, and can you recover patients? So if you just concentrate on the resistance, in both of these drugs, about 40% of patients who become resistant, you can get back into a complete cytogenetic remission again, which is good. I mean, that means that the other percentage don't go there, and that's a bit of a problem. And of these 40% that get a complete cytogenetic response, realistically, about half of them will relapse again. And when they relapse, they relapse with different mutations. So one of the things we worry about is that once resistance happens, resistance may be forever in that as you introduce different selective pressure on this disease with multiple clones, you're simply just going to get a, a, a new clone coming out every, every time. And what happens if you go from imatinib to nilotinib and you relapse and then get to satinib or, or change those orders in any way you want to, it turns out that the mutation that isn't affected by any of these drugs, the 359 mutation, becomes more and more prevalent in every setting. So 359 mutation ends up being sort of the common pathway for natural selection. So all the salvage therapies here are monotherapy? Yes, they're all monotherapy. So this looks at whether or not that IC50 I talked about really makes any difference in clinical practice or not. So this is, a, so the, look at here the complete cytogenetic response rate. And if you divide up the patients into what kind of mutations they have, if you look at those that have a sensitive IC50 to nilotinib, they get the 40% complete cytogenetic response rates. But if you have one of the resistant mutations, your complete cytogenetic response rate is zero. So you don't want to take that drug. Same trend with disatinib. Here are the sensitive mutations, here are the resistance. So it gives you a, a fairly good guideline. Now, one of the things that, that we've been interested in for a while is, um, you know, why do people progress in CML? And, and why do people become resistant? And is there a similarity between those pathways of progression and resistance? And so one of the ways we get it at this is um, by gene expression arrays. Um, so you know, we used to start off, when I started off in the lab, it was, the, the, it was one gene, one postdoc model. You know, you basically handed a postdoc a gene and said, learn all about this gene in the next five years. Um, but now we can actually simultaneously interrogate 30,000 genes simultaneously. Um, so what this is, is a heat map for those of you who are red, green, colorblind, my apologies. Um, these are genes that are differentially expressed in blast crisis versus chronic phase. Uh, with a p-value of 10 to the minus 12th, with most statisticians would believe. So here are the chronic phase patients. Red is genes that are upregulated in blast crisis compared to chronic phase. Green are those that are downregulated in blast crisis compared to chronic phase. So here's this, the, the kind of the color code of the chronic phase, accelerated phase, blast crisis. So there's clearly biological difference. You know, one or a few things like this. You know, we, all, we, we often talk about CML as being three-step process, chronic phase, accelerated phase, blast crisis. But actually, if you look at the gene signatures, 
Here we've looked at the genes that are upregulated and downregulated in blast crisis versus accelerated phase. As you can see, there's a little tail here, but the correlation is like 0.81. And what that tells you is that all of the difference in the biology is pretty much from chronic phase to anything worse. Not much difference in between accelerated phase and blast crisis. The biology change, the real gear shift is having a chronic phase and all other things south of that. The other thing that's interesting is if you compare blast crisis signature to normal hematopoietic CD34 cells. So, and you find out that the gene signatures are quite similar. There's very little difference between a normal CD34 cell and blast crisis. That makes some sense clinically. You know, one of the things in blast crisis is, is essentially refractory to chemotherapy. We can't kill CML blast crisis cells. The reason we can give chemotherapy in patients is that we can't kill your normal CD34 cells either. They're completely resistant. So we think about progression from chronic phase to blast crisis. What really happens is regression. You're basically getting uh, blast cells that are getting more and more primitive and therefore more and more chemo resistant. From this kind of stuff, you can look at not only genes, you can actually look at pathways. So you can look at pathways that are enriched in progression. And, um, and some of these actually make a, a difference in, in targeting therapy. You know, Wnt signaling, so there's now um, a bunch of uh, 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 molecules that are actually working on the beta-catenin and SMO pathways that's involved in Wnt signaling. Myeloid differentiation apoptosis, there's, there's drug therapy now that are trying to target that to, to prevent uh, blast crisis. But to get back to the point of progression and, um, and the link between progression and resistance, um, this is another way you can manipulate this data. We basically put this data and said, line up, give each of these colors a, a, a variable. So, you know, black, which is neutral, no, no change, could be zero points, green, various shades of green, negative points, plus points for redness. And then, and so these patients down here on this scale would be the most chronic phase-like patients. And these patients up here would be most blast crisis-like patients. So what these dots represent are patients who are in chronic phase from the pathologist standpoint, but have point mutations. They got therapy, they got complete remission, they came out, in chronic phase, look fine. And the question is, well, we know those patients behave badly. Even though they look like they're in chronic phase, what's their gene signature? And so we get their gene signature, then we line them up here. And you can see some of these patients who are, really do look like in chronic phase, but a lot of these patients that have progressed look like chronic phase, but they're clearly advanced phase disease. So again, showing the link between the progression profile program and resistance. And this is another way to look at it. Um, so these are our 3,000 genes here that are involved with progression. And then Vivian Oler in the lab um, looked at patients who were in chronic phase untreated versus those that were emancipative resistance. And she found 1,600 genes that were different in those. And of this, 1,200 genes are in the same group, and that's what they look like. So there's a huge overlap between the drive to go to progression and the drive to, to, to look at resistance. You can take these genes now. These are 3,000 genes. That's kind of hard to deal with. Um, but you can do some mathematical modeling and, and you actually get this down to a six gene signature set. So this is looking at six genes that, are in, that, that mathematically are associated with blast crisis. And here's a sample of chronic phase patients. You get them a score. These are all low, except this guy's pretty high up there. Find out what that guy did. And here's your blast crisis samples. And then here's our accelerated phase and, and uh, blast crisis in remission. They kind of bounce around the board, which is what they do clinically. Some people in accelerated phase, you can cure. Some people you can't. And this just shows that you can apply this progression signal to response. Because you would think that we know that, that um, response maps to where you're at in disease phase. So, Excel, you know, blast crisis don't respond to TKIs at all. Chronic phase respond quite well. So what happens if you look at chronic phase patients? Um, do some of them look like chronic phase but actually have molecular signature of blast crisis? So what this is, is looking at two groups here. The blue group are people who are brand new out of the gate CML and get amantidib. The red are people who have failed amantidib but are still in chronic phase. So this signature here is all quite low, but except for these two outliers, it turns out both of these people didn't respond to drug. So they behaved like blast crisis did, even though they look like chronic phase. And here's all your patients who look to be in chronic phase when they start these resistance trials. But as you can see, their signature is in fact quite high.
So we're hoping we can actually use this now to, to tell people up front who should get imatinib therapy, who should get stronger therapy, who might be, should, should go to transplant. You can apply this model, though. It's independent of chemotherapy. You can actually apply it to transplants. We went back and looked at archival samples from chronic phase patients who had transplants. These are all chronic phase patients. People who have a low probability, so a chronic phase like signature, are here. This is a relapse rate for those patients who, even though the pathologist says you're in chronic phase, if your molecular signature of these six genes looks like blast crisis, your risk of relapse is quite higher. So there's probably something, something to this. So in conclusion, diagnosis and treatment in the future. So, you know, I'm a baseball fan. And Yogi Berra says all these interesting things. So Yogi said it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. But I, but I didn't know that Yogi was actually interested in, in theoretical physics because Neil Bohr said the same thing years and years ago. He said prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. So Yogi had a surprising broad range of interests. Um, and I think that, that where we're going in this um, is, first of all, the development of multiple assay platforms. So there's lots of ways that you can do this. Um, a bunch of us here are working with this company called Nanostring, um, which is a way that you can look at both gene expression mRNA expression, potentially microRNA expression, and translocation expression on one platform. So the idea here is you could take, uh, if you knew certain signatures were involved with prognosis, you could have one platform that would take all leukemias, because you can get about 400 targets on this technology, take any leukemia, come in, and basically have a multi-analyte uh, prognostic signature. So I think there's something to that. Um, I'm not, I'll talk about this at a different time if you want. Uh, more sensitive methods, you know, this, there's this fluid eye microfluidic path uh, platform that we use that, as opposed to doing you know, one PCR assay, divides the assay into 10,000 simultaneous PCRs, each of about 10 picoliters. Uh, and at that point, you can actually look at rare copy uh, uh, based on Poisson distribution. So if something's one in a million or so, you can start using that to, to actually quantitate below, a log or two below the sensitivities of normal PCR, which is kind of interesting. Um, and one thing I didn't talk about that is really the work that we're working on our, a lot in the lab is this whole uh, idea of, of clonal heterogeneity. I mean, if you think about why cancers do well or don't do well, and this is not just leukemias, you can imagine it's kind of three simplistic states. One is a, a tumor that's fairly homogeneous and is sensitive, right? Those are the lucky ones where the disease melts away. And then you have a tumor that's homogeneous in, in genotype and resistant. Those are the people who just you can't do anything to. The vast majority are heterogeneous. So you treat them, they respond for a while, they relapse. And people have known for a long time that you often relapse with different mutations than you enter in. About 25% of people who have the FLT3 mutation relapse and with wild type and vice versa. And we've known from the able point mutation stuff that there are many clones here. But the idea is, how can you study many clones over time? How can you see heterogeneity? You can't see it in a gamish of tumor cells. The only way you can get at it is single cell biology. So you know, we've been spending a lot of time dividing cells into single cells and doing genotyping and gene expression on those to try to get an idea of how you can actually model heterogeneity. Because right now, how we treat most leukemias, most diseases, is the perfect way to breed for natural selection. I mean, we, we give therapy and we select out the clones that are resistant. Right? What a surprise. Right? So, you, so if you understood how clonal selection occurred, you actually kind of might be able to use evolution you know, for you, you know, as opposed to against you. And if you knew that stuff, you actually might be using going down the road of a different map um, and, and something like this, the, the, the road to cure as opposed to that other road map that I, I showed before. So lastly, this is how I end most of my talks. Um, this is a natural history of most things. Um, this is true for science, uh, you know, romance. Um, if you've ever had a, a, an English or Italian sports car, you know, first excitement, then, then down here, 2,000 miles, engine block blows up. Um, and this is really true, you know, with, I think, with a lot of these molecular diagnostic stuff. And when we first started doing PCR, we had this enormous excitement because we could now detect one copy of a leukemia cell in a background of a normal million cells, right? And then it became disappointment because we realized that everything uh, in, on our, you know, floor was now contaminated. <laughs> and that's, we wouldn't have to deal with that. But, it, and, but this is true of all these things. I mean, when gene expression arrays came out, in the first one or two years, you basically saw that there was going to be basically, you know, reveal all secrets of biology, you know, within, you know, one grant cycle. And then people realized that mostly what they were doing was reproducing, arraying artifact. 
Um, but you know, with time, things work out. I think we've gotten to the point now where we can u- really use many of these tools to our benefit and really kind of march you know, steadily upstream to, to something that really works and really helps. That's it. Thanks. Chair, one of the nice things about your system, obviously, is leukemia is uh, blood is a representative sample of what's going yeah. on. Can you talk a little bit about how this could be expanded into the solid tumor phase where you've got sampling issues and geographic issues and so forth? Right, so that's, that, that's a, uh, obviously a, a huge issue. Um, the, the, you know, one thing that, that the liquid tumors have taught us is that the heterogeneity that we see, um, or, the, or may, may not be the biggest issue as we like, when you, look at, when you look at people who do the sequencing, whole genome sequencing, and you say, well, don't, as Tim Lee does most of this, you, you say, well, I'm going to send you some samples. Do I need to have... 30, 40, 50 percent blasts, and you know what happens to the normal cells. And what he'll tell you is that don't worry because most of the normal cells you see aren't normal. You do the gene sequencing, even though they look normal, they're they're actually all abnormal. And solid tumors, I would suspect, says some things as well. I mean, I suspect that a lot of the surrounding cells probably aren't normal at all. Um, from a gene expression array signature, it, it it becomes a philosophical standpoint because. There's been debates about this in the breast cancer work on gene expression. If you're looking at prognosis, which has to do a lot with uh, metastasis and stuff, should you get the tumor itself and just carve away all the stroma, or is the stroma really involved in the biology? I mean, you know, is, is it the really tumor that's driving disease, or is it the interaction with the tumor and everything else around it? So you have one camp that says we have to get pure sample as possible. Another camp says, no, no, the, 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 it's a system biology that runs this thing. I want the, the gamisha stuff. I think a, a, lot, a lot depends on, on what you're looking for. For instance, we always talk about this with, all the time in, in um, leukemia, is whether you need to isolate on select you know, CD34 cells or whether you want the whole differentiated spectrum of cells. If you're looking at pure biology of cancer cell versus its normal complement, then you probably need to be as select as possible. Right? If you're looking at the natural history and biology of this, in which case you're treating a whole system, it may well be that the, the gamish cells is what's actually more important. 